Welcome to Hoyt's Bowhunting Whitetails. This week I want to talk about the topic of shot selection and taking the first good shot. This There's going to be a little uh, uh, pain in this one for me because I'm going to go back and talk about the biggest deer that ever got away and uh, how I screwed that up and the lessons that I learned from that. It all has to do with shot selection. It has to uh, has to do with recognizing and then having the nerve to take the first good shot. So let's start with that deer and then uh, we'll come back around to the bigger lesson. So it was uh, 2004, November, uh, I think it was November 6th of 2004. And there was a buck living on our farm back then that uh, I had tons of history with. He was a, uh, let's see, as a two-year-old, he was probably in the 145-inch range, and he lived right on the edge of our lawn. And uh, that year, my wife was bow hunting, and she had two or three shots at that deer one evening and, and uh, wasn't able to connect with him. And she was hunting out of a tree stand that was about 30 yards off the edge of our lawn. And it wasn't right next to the house. I mean, it was across, you know, technically it probably wasn't our lawn, but, you know, we mowed a little extended area around a pond and he was just above that area. And, uh, you know, I took note of that deer thinking, wow, that buck has got a lot of potential. Well, then the next year would have been, uh, that would have been 2005 then, he would have been a three-year-old. And I had some close encounters with him, but I was really almost hoping that he got away because by then he was really big and uh, he scored, we found the shed, one shed off him that winter and that that would have put him, you know, doubling that one and adding 18 inch inside spread would have put him in the 185 range as a three-year-old. So I'm sure that's the biggest three-year-old that I've ever encountered. Uh, so then I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be really interesting next year. So then uh, 2004, yeah, 2004. So it would have been Gosh, I'm getting my, my years wrong. So it would have been 2003 when he was a three-year-old, 2004, he was a four-year-old. And uh, I saw him the first time uh, I was driving down the road and I was coming back home again. I was helping a friend of mine blood trail a deer that he had hit the evening before. And I, I drove past um, you know, a piece of property that I had permission to hunt right before turning into our driveway and I saw him walking across the fence line, walking down the fence line and he was gigantic, uh, huge. And I knew it was the same deer just because of the structure of his rack and the fact that he was living in that same area. So I, I got to the house real quick, ran down. Uh, I thought, well, I mean, he seems like he always circles back around to that spot where my wife missed him as a two-year-old. So I grabbed a tree stand, ran down there, uh, put the stand up and, uh, it was probably 15, 20 yards from the tree that she'd been in. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I saw him, let's see, what did I see? I saw him cross, there was a pasture that I could look into on the neighbor's land. And I saw him cross that pasture, you know, early in the afternoon, probably mid afternoon into our property. And I thought, well, for sure, he's gonna work down that fence line, you know, right to where my tree stand is, right above this pond. And, uh, you know, I kept watching in that direction, didn't see him, didn't see him. Somehow he had to have gotten back across that pasture because the next time I saw him, it was about a half an hour before the end of legal shooting time. And uh, he was coming right along the edge of the timber in that pasture straight at my tree stand. Well, all day long, the wind had been blowing really nice out of the west, blowing, you know, from the direction I expect him to come from, off this little hill that I was sitting on, uh, out, you know, into our yard. And, uh, you know, so I thought for sure, you know, I've got this, you know, pegged. He, he's coming in and I'm going to get a shot at him. Well, he kept coming. And, you know, the whole time he's, he's angling toward me now, straight at me, actually, walking right at me. Great big gigantic deer. I mean, I, I'd never seen anything like this before in a tree stand. And at 30 yards, he turned and he started following an old, like, uh, four-wheeler trail that had been cut into the timber by the people who owned the farm before us. He started following that and he stopped. He's 30 yards away broadside, 
nibbling on some brush. And I remember thinking to myself, boy, I should take this shot. Uh, and then I thought, no, you know, don't be hasty. I, I kind of locked up a little bit, if you want the truth, because he was so big, I just didn't want to screw it up. You know, it's one of those things where you're like, man, don't make a mistake here. He's a giant. Uh, you know, play it smart, play it patient, be careful. Well, I let that 30 yard broadside shot go and he turned and again started heading straight toward the tree stand. And I'm thinking, okay, now he's 20 yards away. He's coming straight at me. You know, I could shoot him right in the middle of the brisket and I'm gonna kill this deer 10 times out of 10. But I thought, no, you know, don't, you know, don't be hasty. <laughs> you know, don't, don't jump the gun, uh, be patient. Well, you know, as often it does right at the end of legal shooting time, or, or you know, not, you know, that half an hour, let's say, right at sunset, the wind will just drop. And then once in a while it'll flutter, you know, it'll kick up and it'll go a different direction. You know, just trying to figure out, you know, how to lay down for the night. Well, it did that. Now he's 20 yards away, coming straight at the tree. The wind kind of flutters and blows back toward him. He locks up, freezes, and then runs out to what I thought was 40 yards. And I'm trying to get a range on him now, and it's dark, getting darker in the timber. And back then, the rangefinders didn't have the lighted reticle, so you couldn't really see them. You, know, you, you could kind of guess and then hold it up to the, you know, to the open sky and try to see what the number said. Finally, I just gave up on it and said, well, that's not going to work. And then he ran out again and stopped. Now he's broadside out there at what I guessed was about 45 yards, roughly. And I thought, well, you know, I can make this shot. So I drew back, you know, held my pin on, took the shot, and, uh, you know, I saw the arrow just streaking right for him. It was, I mean, you could see it just dropping right in on his vitals, and I heard it go thump. You know, I heard it hit him. He tore off, and I was so excited. I thought, man, you know, I got this deer. You know, even after, you know, having it kind of fall apart right in my in my lap uh, I finally got this buck well the next day I went out looking for him I didn't want to look for him that evening I just I don't know just something about it you know you know how it is you just I don't know I was just too afraid of, of making a mistake so I went back the next morning and I found the arrow and all I found on the arrow was just a little bit of meat you know there was no blood on the arrow and I thought oh no this is really bad and uh, then I followed a little scant blood trail, you know, not much more than, you know, if you cut yourself shaving, you know, I found a drop here, a drop there. And I found the buck uh, kind of tending a doe in a cedar thicket on the neighboring property. And I sat there for about, I don't know, an hour, and a half, hour and a half or two hours. And, and finally I just snuck in there and tried to, you know, try to see if I could get closer to him and they were gone. Well, I saw the deer again uh, five or six days later from another tree stand in that same basic area, and he looked fine. You know, it was really windy. I tried to stop him for the shot, but the tree I was in was moving too much. I just couldn't shoot. He was, again, a little bit longer shot, 40, 45 yards. Um, so I didn't take the shot, but I saw him. He seemed fine. You know, it didn't look like anything was wrong with him. Well, I kept hunting him a whole rest of the season, and then uh, finally that winter, I heard that the neighbors had found a big deer. So I asked if I could see it. And uh, it was that buck. They'd found him dead. And they found him dead during the, the firearm season in December. And I don't know, you know, when the deer died, but again, he seemed totally fine after my, you know, basically it was a flesh wound, I'm sure. What I think happened was at that distance, you know, I've seen so much since then with the videos that we've taken, you know, of how the deer will drop you know, they'll hear the sound of the shot, especially if they're a little bit alert, like this buck was definitely alert. I'm sure he dropped, you know, at the sound of the shot. And even though my arrow looked really good, the little part of it that I could see, you know, I couldn't see it all the way to the deer. The part that I could see it dropping in looked really good. Well, the hit had to have been really high because, like I said, again, there was just no blood on the arrow, just a little bit of meat, which would say that, you know, he had to have ducked under it and it caught the very top of the deer. Well, anyway, uh, that was a really hard pill to swallow. You know, it took me several years to get over that because that was the buck of a lifetime, basically. And uh, I came away with the lesson that you have to take the first shot that you know you can make. Don't wait for the perfect shot because it may never come. And the first shot that I knew I could make a 30-yard broadside shot, and I've been practicing a lot. You know, I was really good with my bow. 
and the deer was completely relaxed, nibbling on brows, that was a dead deer. Uh, I just was afraid. I just didn't want to be too aggressive. I was being overly careful. I think that's the lesson is, you know, you, you have to prepare uh, the best that, that you can, but don't be afraid when the time comes to take that shot. That's what you prepared for. Um, had I taken that 30 yard broadside shot, I'm sure I would have gotten the deer. What a cool story, you know, to have all that history with a deer right on the edge of our lawn, you know, killing him 40 yards off the edge of the lawn. Uh, you know, what a neat story. And I just felt like, you know, this is, you know, this is the way it's supposed to work. And it, and it just didn't, it didn't play out. So uh, that's the lesson. That's what I want to talk about today is how to recognize the first good shot. The... Uh, Again, it's just the one that you know you can make, the first shot that you know you can make. But you have to be at full draw for that to happen. You can't be waiting until the deer presents itself for the shot before you draw it. And I think a lot of uh, beginning bow hunters, they wait too long to draw the bow. You know, I've had a lot of experiences with guys in the tree with me filming me, and in the early days of Midwest Whitetail, I would have those guys bring their bows with and we'd called some of these deer cameraman bucks. You know, it's like if a deer came in, he was a mature buck and I didn't want him, you know, they would just swing the camera over to me and I would film them while they tried to kill it. Well, I found that most of the time, you know, these are reasonably inexperienced bow hunters. They were always um, way too passive when it came to getting their bow back. You know, I'd have to say, draw your bow, draw your bow. You know, and then they'd be like, you know, really uncomfortable with the whole situation. I think the key is you got to get your bow back. You know, it, it seems simple enough, but as soon as a deer gets within bow range and it looks like a shot's going to be presented at some point within the next, say, 30 seconds to a minute, uh, get your bow back. You know, you can hold it for that long. Um, but if you wait too long, you know, that moment might only be three or four seconds long when that deer presents that angle that's perfect. Like maybe he sees something to the side, turns to leave or whatever, and in the process of doing that, he opens up for the shot. Well, if you're not at full draw, if you're waiting, then that moment is gonna pass you by. So uh, I've had a few other experiences like that over the years where you know, I just wasn't ready. You know, I didn't have my bow back, I wasn't aggressive enough, and then as soon as that opportunity came, you know, I wasn't there you know, to take advantage of it. So that's my tip for today is uh, you, know, you don't want to be unethical about it. You're not taking a risky shot. You're taking the first shot that you know you can make. Don't wait for the perfect one. Uh, so hopefully uh, you took something from my pain. Uh, that was the darkest season that I ever had. And I learned a lesson from that part of it too. And that is I'm never going to lose sleep over a deer again. Uh, that wasn't any fun. You know, I kicked myself every day when I went on the tree stand, you know, after that buck got away. And I spent all these hours staring at the ceiling in our bedroom during the middle of the night, you know, trying to relive that moment and change something about it, you know, change the way it turned out. But um, I'll, I'll never do that again. I don't care how big the deer is. I'm not going to give the deer that much power to uh, affect how I feel about hunting. And... Uh, to take the, the joy out of the sport the, the way that that encounter did with that buck. So anyway, uh, I appreciate you joining me this week. I'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Hoyt's Bowhunting Whitetails. And remember to always dream big.